welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Jen Cobray. Are you ready? Yeah. All right, in order for this to happen, we got to get down. I'm getting down my knees, pray. Stand to your feet. Let's go before the Lord. Father, we come to you in the name of, come on, stand up. You can do that. If you can't, then that's okay. Sit down. And Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, giving you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor. We thank you, Father, for a mighty move of your spirit in our hearts tonight. Because, Lord, we haven't come to hear from a man or woman. We've come to hear from the teacher of the church, the Holy Spirit. So welcome, Holy Spirit. Touch us, heal us, strengthen us, encourage us, guide us, guard us, direct us, and motivate us to be all that you would have us to be. And, Lord, we'll give you the praise, glory, and all the honor We thank you, Father, for this great time that we get to gather together, clap our hands, sing songs about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Be in like fellowship with each other and people of the same faith. And we thank you, Father, that we're here and we're blessed by you and your word. But we would ask, Lord, that you bless all the churches in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet that are preaching and hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Bless our Baptist brothers and Lutherans and Methodists and Episcopalian, Charismatics and Pentecostals. Thank you for Calvary Chapels and Harvest and Valley and Oasis and Inland Christian Center, the Assemblies of God, Four Square Denomination. We thank you, Father, for the great things you're doing in Trinity, Emmanuel Baptist Ecclesia Church, the way. We thank you, God, for San Bernardino Temple. Bless the Adventists and our Catholic brothers and sisters, Lord. At no time do we think of ourselves as better than anybody, but we see ourselves as co-laborers, workers together, one field, building one kingdom, not a man's, but yours. May all the praise and glory go to you. Jesus' mighty name, with a great big shout, we all say, Amen. Amen. The title of the message, I'm changing the title of the message. You know, on Sunday nights, it's always... He lives this whole month long. We're doing a series. It's our Easter time of the year, and we're we're doing a series on He Lives. But I'm changing the message title from He Lives Part 1 to He Lives Part 2. Okay, you didn't get that, did you? All right. Jeez, okay. He Lives Part 2, and... (laughs) Okay, I'm getting red. (laughs) And it's because he lives that we live. And that's the great thing of this. But what in the world does that mean? He lives. I love the word of the Lord. All kinds of great scriptures on the fact that he lives. Let me just make a statement to you. It's because he lives that we live. And most people that call themselves Christians have no idea how to live. They know that because he lives, we live eternally in heaven. They know that because they're Christians, they're solid in eternal life. That they are going to heaven. And their concept of living is when they get into heaven. And yet Jesus made this statement, I have come to give you life, not just in the heavens, but here on earth. And he says, I have come to give you life, and that life that I'm going to give you is a life that is more abundant. And so when I make a statement, because he lives, we live, it can be a real cliche that just kind of like floats through all of our thinking, and we all say amen, and oh, praise God, but we really don't know what in the world it means to live as a Christian. It's the most amazing life you could ever imagine, and nowhere else on the planet can you get life like the life that Jesus gives us. And it's so glorious and so fantastic. It is the fulfillment, you got to hear this, it is the fulfillment of every desire of your heart. If there's anything you'll ever know at the end of your life, you will know these words, that God is faithful. And his promises are yea and amen. 
And you will know that when you are born of the Spirit of God, you are eligible for the life that God paid for you to have. If you don't know what that is, and you don't know what that means, and you don't know what to look for, and you don't know how to adapt to it, and you don't know how to appropriate it, you'll never do anything. And so when I make a statement, we live because he lives, it's a great Easter statement, but it's even better when you know what life is all about on this planet. Life every day. What's it like to really live? What's it like to really be free? Every one of us have life expectations that are different. To the drug addict, they want to be free of their addictions and want to have a clear mind and have a solid resolution so they don't have to feel as if they can rely and lean on drugs again to face the lifestyle that they live. To those that are captured by the flesh, what would it really be like to be set free from the flesh? Those that have been in bondage to their own small thinking and never have any hope and never have any dreams or vision, just want to exist on the planet. What happens when life comes to them? All of a sudden they start to get a vision, they start to see, they start to believe. And it's all wrapped up in this fabulous word called hope that God gives us because we live. In 2 Timothy, the second chapter, just a couple of verses before I just go any further. I just want to take you there to 2 Timothy, the second chapter, in verse number 11. It says, this is a faithful saying. You know, when you hear someone make a statement, this is a faithful saying, trust me, it is something you can go to the bank on. That's, that's what they're saying. This is a faithful saying. For if we died with him, and I don't know if you noticed it or not, but notice the words, if we died with him. 2 Timothy, 2nd chapter, verse number 11. If we died with him. And what does that mean? If we died with him. Really powerful statement. It's a really an amazing comment. I always taught you this. The biggest little word in the Bible is the word if. So powerful. A lot of times people say, when you get born of the Spirit of God, you die to your flesh. I want you to know something. There's a lot of people that are born of the Spirit of God and their flesh still runs them. And they're not entering into it, nor are they enjoying the life that God gives them because the flesh is in their way. But he comes along and says, if you died with him, we shall also live with him. And then verse number 12 says this bizarre statement, which is kind of like crazy. I, I love verse number 11 because it, you know, it's, it's a statement that I can handle. If we die with him, we can also live with him. Verse number 12 comes along, just pop it up on the overhead, if we endure if I know who I am and I know what he's done and I know what he expects and I know how I see things and I understand the plan of God that has been fulfilled in the word of God and by the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that God paid the price for me, then I'm telling you the truth when I make this statement, you can endure. But if you don't know there's an endurance process Yes, the process is, the, as far as redemption, everything is done. As far as someone going to the cross, nobody else has to go. It's already been paid for. But how you live your life until Jesus takes you home has to do with how you're going to approach the life that God's given you. And if you don't approach the life that God's given you, then my goodness, come on, let's be honest with each other. And you're just sitting back waiting for something to happen. Let's be honest with each other. That's why we know so many Christians have nothing, never do anything, never be anything. Why? Because they're waiting for something to happen. And God says, listen, if you endure, if you understand who you are in Christ Jesus, understand what he's done and the life that he's given to you, there's no reason in the world why you shouldn't be able to endure. But still the word if is up there because it's your option. Because a lot of people come along, get saved, have a relationship with God, back off of God. Say, so, wait a minute, I, I just can't handle this. Nothing changes. What changes is you. 
And if you're not willing to change to what he has for you, can I just say something right now? Then the life that he wants to give you will never be yours. Yes, you'll have eternal life. Yes, you'll go to heaven. But while you're here on earth, you're a beat up soul. And nobody wants what you have. They don't even want to know about your God because you're a witness that says, man, I am down, defeated, destroyed. How many of you know people? Don't raise your hand. How many of you know Christians? Man, you don't want to be like them at all. It's like they just fell out of the toilet or something. It's just horrible. They have a horrible life. If you endure, we shall also reign with him. If we deny, what is that deny stuff? Wait a minute, wait a minute. I, I thought he was talking about life. I thought he was talking about enduring. I thought he was talking about us as Christians. And then he comes along and makes this statement in the same verse, if we deny him. In other words, can I just say something? You could say no to the ways of God. Have you ever noticed that? I mean, you could say no. You could say, hey, God, forget it. I'm not doing it. My flesh doesn't want to do it. Not gonna do, I'm going to live my life my way. God wants you to get involved in what I have instead of me getting involved in what you want. My way, not your way. And he comes along and he says, if you deny him, he also will deny us. My job as a pastor to get you so strong in Jesus, so strong in the life that God has available to you that you partake of that life, there's no way in the world you're ever going back to deny him. No way in the world you're ever going to slip out of the, the pocket. No way in the world you're ever going to do anything but go on with God. That's the pastor's job. That's what makes it exciting around this place. So for all of us, verse number 13 pops up. I don't know if we have that. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. So he comes and he makes a statement, if we are faithless, we don't have any faith in him. We've denied him. Did you know he's still God? That's what he's saying. He's still God. He's not looking the other way. He knows who he is. He's going on with what he has to do. It's kind of a fascinating little understanding because really his Faith towards me is not based on my faith towards him. Isn't that good news? Yet my faith towards him is based on his faith towards me. Is anybody listening? And without an understanding of that, I'm always looking to myself to understand how my future is going to be. It's not based on me, it's based on him. And if I can get off of my ability and get on his ability, because it's him on the inside that makes it all work, then all of a sudden, I cannot fail because of the God that dwells on the inside of me. It's true. Come on. So important for us to see. Just real quick, we're playing with some verses. Galatians, the second chapter, verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Paul writes this to the church at Corinth and he says this, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith, where? In the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. What a powerful verse. I mean, if there's anything you ought to memorize, if you're ever stopping to think about, I wonder what verse I'd, I ought to memorize. Here's a good one. Here's one you ought to talk about every day when it comes to who you are. Here's Paul the Apostle, one of the greatest apostolic men of, our, of any time, writer of two-thirds of the New Testament. Here he is. He's got this anointing on him. He's bringing the dispensation of grace, a new time period of grace. People didn't understand it at all, what grace was all about. Paul gets this amazing revelation, brings it to the church. And he says these words about it. He didn't puff himself up, didn't look at himself a certain way, didn't say his anointing, didn't say anything. He said, I'm crucified with Christ. In other words, he understand the process. The process is 2,000 years ago when Jesus went to the cross and died, he took you with him. Wait a minute, you didn't get that at all. When Jesus went to the cross and was crucified, he took you with him. That is an amazing thought. You say, wait a minute, I wasn't born then. I know, but he knew you would be. And he went to the cross and he took that on. And you were crucified with him. 
And then he makes a statement about the crucifixion. Listen to this. It is no longer I who live. In other words, it's, I, I, I'm not living my life. I'm not living what I want, what I feel, what I think. See, there's one thing neat about being a Christian. You get out of doing your stuff and start doing his stuff. And if you're not willing to get out of your stuff and get into his stuff, I doubt you're going to make it as a Christian. You'll end up denying him and never end up uh, enduring to the end. And this is all about change. This is all about getting out of where you're at, getting to where he's at. What you used to be, what you now are, what you have, you have dealt with things before, what you can deal with them like now. He says these words, it's no longer I who lives, but Christ lives in me. In other words, the source of my living is the God that's inside of me. You talk about a fanatical, radical relationship, that's one. Someone comes along and says, you know what? Someone said this the other day, I can't go to this church, it's too radical. Can I tell you something about churches? Churches need to be radical, and we're not radical enough, if you want to know the truth. <laughs> Bottom line, we're not radical enough. And I'm not talking about crazy fanaticism where people go out and drink grape juice in Guyana and follow some fool. I'm talking about following the Word of God. When you get into the Word of God and understand the Word of God, can I tell you something? Listen, the Word of God, it is radical. Because listen to what he says. Listen to this. But Christ lives in me, and the life I which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. In other words, I've got my faith in him. In other words, here's how this all works. He's faithful whether I'm faithful or not. But guess what? I'm faithful because he's faithful. And he says, it's my faith in him. Every day you've got to get out of bed and say to yourself, well, I don't know how I'm going to make it. Man, I don't know if I can make it, but I got good news. I got Jesus on my side. He's my king. He's my glory. He's on the inside of me, and nothing and no weapon formed against me shall prosper. And I want you to know something. All things are possible to him that believes. And that's what he's talking about, new life opens up right there. Not, not an old life, not an extension of your old life and just die and go to heaven. I'm talking about new life. Yeah. Man, what a statement. He comes on the life which I now live in the flesh. That's every day. I live how? How do I make it every day? How do I live every day? How do I believe God for something I don't know how to do? How do I believe God to get something I don't know how to get? How do I believe God for something to happen I don't know how to make happen? How do I believe God for something I can't see? That's what faith is all about. Amen. And he comes along and he says this words. He says, the life in which I now live in the flesh, I live how? By faith in the Son of God. In other words, for me not to get the life that he paid for, you're going to have to get God out of the way. And I don't think you can do it. Is that powerful? Who loved me, who loved me, who loved me, who loved me when I was unlovable and you were unlovable, who loved me when... We were unforgivable. He forgave us who loved me. When he should have passed judgment, he gave us mercy. When we should have nothing, he gives us grace. My goodness sakes, my friends, who loved me and then proved it by giving himself. Come on. To me, we're talking about living. What kind of life are you going to live? You know, you're going to make excuses for all the days of your life when there's a feast called life waiting for you and you're settling for dog food in a plate. I got a little puppy dog. He's smarter than most Christians. He won't eat the dog food. He waits for the human food. You know what I'm talking about? If you've got a little puppy, you know what I'm talking about. They sit there and beg. I'm cooking and he, he's climbing up my leg. But I put dog food down here. Four months old. Where did he get that? He's just showing me how smart a dog is. 
Sometimes we humans eat dog food and miss the platter. Are you following me? We live in a world less than life that God gives us. And we tolerate it and we conform to this world that's less than what God had paid for on that. That wasn't an abundant life. That's just a get-by life. And God wants us to see it differently. <sighs> Amazing. Romans, the sixth chapter, verse six, says it like this. Man, I'm out of, almost out of time. This is a, how did this happen? <laughs> just get all carried away, don't I? Romans, the sixth chapter, verse six says, knowing this, this is what we ought to know. When you say the words knowing something, you ought to know something. Most people read that knowing this, like, oh, I should know it, but I don't. Most people that are Christian don't have any idea about what he's gonna say. That the old man was crucified with him. The body of sin might be done away with that we have no longer be slaves of sin. Someone comes along and says, I want to go to church, but I want change. I'm going to tell you something, you got the wrong church. Yeah, now, they can go to church somewhere, and they'll take care of you and cuddle you, but I want you to know something. When you come into this house, you better get ready for change. The old man's dead, and we're not letting you live the way you used to live. We're going to move you on into what you ought to be. Are you hearing me? So don't come in and tell me all this stuff. You say, well, I'm, don't come in and tell me. Well, I'm born this way. I want you to know something. I thought you got born again. So you're born that way, but you're now born again. Old things pass away. Behold, all things become what? New. So don't go giving me that stuff. We're going to sit around and compromise on sin. This is the way my daddy was. I don't care how your daddy is. Have you ever checked out your daddy in heaven? He isn't that way. This is the way my mommy is. I want you to know something. Your family isn't that way in heaven. It's that way on the earth. And you can follow your family on the earth or you can follow the God Almighty that's great and mighty and all things are possible to him that believes. See, this is where we fail all the time and miss life. Totally missed life. Old man was crucified. Wait a minute. I thought, if you're saved, you've been crucified with Christ. That the body of sin, that stuff that used to control us and used to motivate us and used to take us down the wrong path and used to lead us to a place where we got defeated and destroyed, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. In other words, I don't have to do what my flesh says, what the world says, what the, immor uh, the majority of people say. I don't have to live my life like junk any longer because I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus. I like what Pastor Luke said the other day. He has decided to have an alternative lifestyle. It's called Christianity. And that's the alternative lifestyle that all of us ought to turn to. Somebody ought to give me a great big amen. <laughs> different from the world, different from the sin, different from the garbage that's out there, we're going on with Jesus. Somebody ought to say amen. amen. I'm going to do this in seven minutes. How to live in his life. Because all of that's good. That was supposed to be five minutes long, but you made me crazy. All that clapping and shouting and screaming and huffing and puffing. You just had to come out. It was like that little puppy dog. When I wake him up in the morning, he comes out of his skin. Jumps up in the air, does spin spurls, lands on his back, rolls around, eyeballs roll back. He's, he's freaked out because I've come into the room. I walk into Deborah's and say, hi, Deborah. She's a hi. <laughs> I think that dog likes me a whole lot more. <laughs> that dog is something else. Comes out of his skin. You ought to come out of your skin when you get into the house of God. <laughs> Leaving an old man behind and reaching forward to the things of the Lord. Somebody say amen. How to live in his life. I want to know how to live. I want to figure this out. It all starts with C. I love these words. C, and the second one is stop, and the third one is live. So three little words that we're going to see. Number one, see yourself as dead. 
You got to, listen, when sin comes, can I just tell you something? When sin comes knocking at your door, and it will, men, you cannot turn the channels on the remote without sin knocking at your door. Knocking at your door is something that touches your heart and speaks to your mind. That's knocking on your door. There's not a time that sin's not going to knock on your door. Even when you think you've defeated it, it'll lay low for a while and come back. And you've got to see yourself. Oh, no, I'm not going there. I'm dead. Dead don't go to where the flesh wants them to go. Is anybody listening? There is no habit. There is no addiction. There is no bad circumstances, no issues that you have that you shouldn't see as dead. Sixth chapter, you're there anyway, in Romans, the 11th verse says it like this. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. See the words reckon yourself? means you got to start considering yourself to be dead. Instead of alive looking for something, you're dead, realize it. Likewise, you also reckon yourself, consider yourself to be dead indeed to sin. Sin comes up, <laughs> you're talking to the wrong person. Sin comes up, I'm not looking at it anymore. Sin comes up, I'm not listening to that stuff. Sin comes up, I'm not there. I'm not going to be involved. I'm not thinking about it. We're going to talk more about this on Wednesday night. As we go to John 13 chapter, powerful verse, verses. But I reckon myself, I'm dead. Can I tell you something? Until you see yourself dead to the flesh, you will never change anything. Mm -hmm. even a diet. Now, I know because I'm fatter now than I've ever been. That little puppy dog looks at me while I'm taking a shower. I'm going, get away. What are you looking at? He's outside the shower and looking through the glass, you know? <laughs> Just in there, I'm thinking to myself, you know, I'm thinking to myself, I'm thinking, I, I know dogs don't have any brains, but what's he staring at? <laughs> He's got all soap all, go away. Oh, go away, you know what I'm saying? Go away. And then I start to think, maybe, maybe, maybe he's not as dumb as I think he is. And all of a sudden, the dog starts looking at me, staring at me in the shower, and he starts to shake his head. <laughs> what is that? What is that? I can just all of a sudden hear his mind. Man, you look so ugly fat. You should be the dog. I, I'm, I'm a liar. You know, and we, and we won't even lose a pound until we see ourselves as people that are not going to allow the flesh to speak to us anymore because dead people don't hear it. Is anybody listening? Dead people don't hear it. They don't see it. They don't move in it. They don't see it at all. And I tell you, it's just as simple as that. you got to see yourself as someone who's not a participant in that stuff that wants to come and hold us back and keep us from the life that God has is anybody listening? Number two, and how to live in his life. You've got to stop the flesh from awakening. It's always going to waken up. It wants to roll over in its grave. It wants to start, oh, I've got it under control. I'll, 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 I'll just, uh, I'll just, uh, I could do this. When you kill something, you don't go back and dig it up. Leave it dead. Don't say you control it. Get rid of it. Let it go. When it's dead, it's dead. Make sure it stays dead. Don't give it any thought. The Bible says, cast down imaginations that exalt itself above the knowledge of God and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. In other words, when something comes at me, I get rid of it immediately. I don't think about it. I'm not meditating it. I'm not planning it. I'm not looking at it. I'm, I'm getting that off. Flip the channels. Have you ever flipped through the channels? You can have all of the 
the stuff on your on your uh, our uh, our Verizon, you know, we got it all blocked out. The stuff still comes up. You know why? It's a trap from the Satan to get you. Not gonna get me. Pew. I'm turning the station. Galatians 5:24 says it like this. And those that are in Christ have crucified the flesh. And they didn't just crucify the flesh with all of its passions and desires. One translation says lusts. With all of its passions. When the passions and the desires start to come up, you got to make sure it stays crucified. Don't go there. Don't think about it. Don't meditate it. Get rid of it quick. We're talking about living in a life that God has for us. We're going to have to make sure this flesh doesn't come up. Number three, and I like this one. We're talking about seeing yourself as dead, stopping the flesh from awakening. Number three, live for righteousness. Make it your goal. Live for righteousness. In other words, this is the way we do things, what God's word says. God's way, God's want, God's desire, not my will and and God's, uh, but God's will, God's way, God's want. What does God say about my marriage? What does God say about my children? How does God want me to do my business? How does God want me to pray in the morning? What does God want me to communicate with him? How does God want me to approach the throne of grace? How does God want me to respond to this situation? Living a life that has been controlled by righteousness is vitally important for you to live the life that God paid for on that cross at Calvary. There's an interesting verse. We use it for healing all the time, but sometimes we don't see what it says before the healing part of the scripture. 1 Peter 2.24 says it like this, who himself bore our sins on his own body, on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness. In other words, you're going to have to make it your goal to live for righteousness, not live just to get by. Not live just to have a token relationship with God. Not just live because you call yourself a Christian and that's good enough. But to live for righteousness. That means what God says, you do. That means the way God says to do it, you do it. That means the whole idea of how to do life, God shares with you how to do it. Living for righteousness is your goal and my goal. That we, having died to sin, might live for righteousness righteousness then the famous part of that verse by his stripes were healed a lot of times we don't see the verse before that how to live in his life see yourself as dead stop the flesh from awakening three live make it your goal for righteousness make a life of righteousness without that my friends we'll never have what God wants for us your desires in life are not bad. Your des- Let me say it again. Your desires for life is not bad. Your desires without God is bad. You've got to bring God into your desires. And when God's in your desires, he'll fulfill your desires. But God outside of your desires, you're on your own. Want a better house? want a better marriage, want a better car, want a better health, want a better life, want a be- all of which God paid for on that cross. But until you bring God into your desire, instead of keeping your desire separate from God, you'll never have the desires of your heart. And God desires to give you the desires of your heart, to live life. That's what life's all about. It's a freedom to attain while you're here on the earth. And be what God's called you to be so that you could be a witness to a lost and dying world. If God spoke to you, come on, give the Lord a great big praise. You do that? Let me talk to you for a minute before I let you go. How many enjoyed church this weekend? Wow, isn't it great? Why don't we have a Monday night service? Would anybody show up if we had a Monday night service? Seriously, seriously. How many, if, if we had a Monday night, Monday night service start at 7 o'clock, raise your hand if you really would come. Really? How about Tuesday night? How about Wednesday night? 
Okay, I'm checking you out. Wednesday night, we'll see you Wednesday night. Okay, some of you need to get saved tonight. That's all. Saved means you give your heart to Jesus. Come on. I already know you know who Jesus is in your head. I already know that. You celebrate Christmas and Easter every year of your life and you know it. You know who Jesus is. But listen to me, listen, listen, listen. But that won't get you to heaven. The devil knows who Jesus is. And he's not a Christian going to heaven. So the fact that you know who Christian, Jesus is doesn't make you a Christian. Jesus comes along and says, if you're going to get to heaven, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man goes to the Father except by me. You're not going to make it any other way except his way, right? Okay, because he said that. Simple. Now listen to the words of what he said. No man goes to the Father except by me. So what he just said, he's, he, he's just made a statement, and you know it's true, you can't get to heaven any other way. America thinks they can get to heaven a lot of different ways, but America is wrong. You're not going to make it. Jesus comes and tells us how to get to heaven in, in, in John 3rd chapter. He says, you must be born again. Now I know the word born again means right off the bat, rejection, you put your wall up, you stop, you say born again are crazy, goofy people. That's because Hollywood portrayed them that way in movies and magazines and stories. But that's not true. That's not what we're talking about. To be born again means this, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. It means you've given God all of your heart. You've given God all of your life. It's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. Always has been, always will be. God forgive us in American churches that we've watered that down. All or nothing, I'll prove it to you. Last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation, you've heard of it. It's the last book in the Bible. Jesus himself is speaking. He says, I'm coming again. And when I come, I better find you hot or I better find you cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Do you know what he just really said? What he really said is this. People that call themselves Christians that are lukewarm are not real Christians at all. And they're going to get vomited from the mouth of Jesus. Wow, wait a minute. Hold on. Hold on. Yep, that's what, exactly what it means. You can call yourself a Christian, be lukewarm, and end up in hell. And somebody needs to tell you. Because you can't get to heaven because you call yourself a Christian. Here's how. In order to get to heaven, you're going to have to be born again. Born again means you've got to give God all of your heart, give God all of your life. You've got to give it to him because he's not a thief to rob it from you. He's not a conniver to talk you out of it. He's not a manipulator to make you do this, hit you in the head with a two-by-four and force you to do this. Uh-uh. He could have made robots that look just like you if he wanted to do that, that'll worship him, but he doesn't. He gives you a free will choice for you to make the choice, for you to make the call. Are you going to give God all of your heart? Are you going to give God all of your life? Listen to this. Then life starts when you... When you Become bored again. Until then, you're just a religious person going to church. You must be born again. That's what Jesus said. I didn't say it. So you can't get to heaven because you're nice. You can't get to heaven because you know your neighbors like you. You can't get to heaven because you know you eat the right foods or you belong to this organization or that organization. You get to heaven because you've given God all of your heart. You've given God all of your life. It is an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, wait a minute. We've stopped and think about it. We've laughed. We've clapped. We've sung songs. You were great listening to the word of God. Why not tonight give God all of your heart in this safe and friendly place? Give God all of your life. Why not tonight? I mean, you couldn't find a better time to give God all of your heart and give God all of your life. Be born again, watch this, headed for heaven and denying your presence in hell. Because I know you don't want to go to hell. Nobody does. Even if you say to yourself, well, I don't really believe in hell. So what? Is it because you don't believe in it make it go away? Of course not. It's a very real place discussed many times in Scripture, even by Jesus. So come on, let's talk. You need to give God what you have. And that's all of your heart. 
in all of your life. Nobody can make you do this. Nobody can work their way to heaven by doing certain things except giving God all of your heart, giving God all of your life. And that's what born again means. Now watch. If you haven't done it, I'm speaking to you. If you haven't done that yet, you may know him in your head, you may celebrate Christmas and Easter, but you haven't yet really, really, really given him all of your heart and all of your life, then I'm speaking to you. And tonight, it's your night of salvation. You say, well, Pastor Jim, how, how do I do that? Let's do it God's way, okay? Let's don't do it your way or my way. Let's do it God's way. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. Remember, we even read that on there. If you deny me, I'll deny you. So today, here you are in this safe, friendly place. I'm going to count to three. I'll go like this. One, two, three. And I'll pop my hands. You've got to go bang. Bang. When you hear that sound, bang. Your hand goes up. I'll see your hand go up. As soon as you hear that sound, bang. Your hand goes up. I'll see your hand go up, and then you can put it right back down. How easy is that? How easy is that? The raising of the hand, you're saying something to me. He said, I, I, you're saying, I want to go to heaven. I don't want to go to hell. I want to give God all my heart, give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying hell. I'll see your hand go up, and you can put it right back down. That's, that's that simple. Because Jesus said, if you confess me where before men, I'm a man, I'll see it. He said, I'll confess you as mine before my father, but if you deny me, I'll deny you. Hey, it's your call. Your call. I've done my job. I told you the truth. I can't make you do it. I'm just telling you that you know who you are. You know you should be getting your hand up when you hear me count and pop my hands together. You know you should. Why wouldn't you do it? Some of you might say, well, I feel it funny. I'm with people, they'll see me, my hand go up, I'll be embarrassed. People behind me will see me. Who cares what people think? Isn't it more important that, you, that God sees you than what people think? I mean, you'd go to hell because you care more about what people think? That's like totally stupid. And I don't believe you're stupid. I believe today is your day of salvation. Are you hearing me? Are you listening? Today is your day of salvation. I'm going to count three, pop my hands together. Come on, let's get right with God. And listen to this, enter into the life that Jesus has for you, more abundant than you can ever imagine or think the scripture says. I'm going to count to three, I've done my job, here it is. One, two, three. Let me see your hands, let me see your hands. There's one, there's two, there's three, there's four. Thank you, God bless you. Back over here, there's five, thank you. There's six, thank you, God bless you. Anybody else, there's six wise people. Anybody else, the family room, there's seven right here in the front row, God bless you. I already got that family room, anybody else? There's another one back here, oh, there's eight, gotcha man, cool. There's eight, anybody else, real quick? There's eight wise people. How many, how many of you know that, I, I, can you feel if there's more than eight? Does anybody besides me know there's more than eight? Can you, can you, can you just feel that? I know there's a couple more if you need to raise your hand. Where are you? You're sitting there saying, I, I wish this old man would just shut up. <laughs> I will as soon as you raise your hand. <laughs> Anybody else? Anybody else? I'm going to cut it off and you're going to miss God. You, it, did you already put your hand up back there though? I already, I, I, I'm not sure. I got one. I got one in there. Is that, how many in there totally? Uh, okay, I already got them. I already got them. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? How many was there? Eight? Where were you? Nine and ten. You need to get your hand up. Well, let's give the Lord a great big praise for eight wise people. And now, even out of the family room, I want all eight of you to get hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend, stuff. Nobody leaves the auditorium during this period of time. That's rude. Now, wait a minute. If you're number eight, I can feel you. I can feel you. I know God spoke to me about this. Listen, if God could speak to me about what to say to you, then God can speak to me about how many people, and there's a couple more of you that need to stop messing around. Check with your neighbor and say, come on, I'll go if you'll go. Just say that to your neighbor. And then, listen, all eight of you and anybody that should have raised your hand but you didn't, you can come too. I want you to get your stuff, get your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend, 
No one leaves during this period of time. Get in the aisle and meet me right here in front. All eight of you and 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, you come too. Right now, come on, come, come, come on up here. Hurry, Won't come on. Won't you come just as you are? Come on, check with your neighbor. Get up here, come on. Oh, and hear the Spirit call. No. Still come and give him a hand as they come. He'll give you life everlasting. He'll give you well, thank God you guys. Oh man, put a smile on your face. This is not a bad thing. This is a good thing. You're not going to hell. You're going to go to heaven. <laughs> Let your face know you're happy. <laughs> it's a good thing. Everybody up here in front, I want you to look to your left. This is Pastor Joel. Pastor Joel's a really good guy. No weird stuff goes on, okay? He's going to do three things. Here's the three things. Number one, he's going to pray with you to invite Jesus into your heart. Number two, he's going to give you some free information, stuff to take home and read about what to do next now that you're a Christian. Number three, he's going to introduce you to a program that we have called Spiritual Personal Trainers. Now listen, you need someone to help you get strong in Jesus. That's what a personal trainer does, but it's a spiritual personal trainer. He'll explain that to you. It's free. We're here for you. We just love you a whole lot. We just want you to know, don't clap. Just let them come. It's okay. Come on. You're, you're, they're listening. Now, here's what we want you to do. What we want you to do is that if you're going to give God all of your heart, let us help you to do that. Stop and think about it. You walked an aisle of a church down to the front in front of the devil, every demon in hell, and in front of God. And you said you're gonna give God all of your heart. You said you're gonna give God all of your life. That's what it's all about. That's called being born again. Let us help you to stay committed. Let us help you to go on with God. If you'll give God, just that time you'll meet with spiritual personal trainers about five weeks before a church service. But after that, if you'll give this church a year and just get in here and let's learn about what the word of God says for a year of your life, if you'll give God one year, I'm talking about getting in a church one, two times a week, one year, the rest of your life, God will bless you beyond your imagination. Am I telling the truth or not? I'm telling the truth, but it's your call. But you said you were gonna give God all of your heart and all of your life. So real quick, Pastor Joel's right over there. Make a left turn, just follow him right over there. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise.